This conference will now be recorded. All right, welcome everybody. Good to have you all back. We've been away for a few weeks, but we're ready now to resume uh, 10 Sundays for Doctrine 301 through 310. And uh, I believe this takes us through 4th of July weekend. I was going to look at that. One, two, three, four, five in May. Four in June. Okay, so that does get us through July 4th. We're actually going to push it out to July 11th. If uh, you want to mark your calendars now uh for may 23rd on may 23rd we will not be having class so you want to you'll want to uh, make a note of that we'll have today the 9th and the 16th so we'll have three in a row then we'll take a, a sunday off on the 23rd and then we'll come back for the 30th go all through june and uh, have july 4th and july 11th that's the schedule and after July 11th, we'll have a break. We'll come back in August. And we'll see. We're still tentative on the return date for August, but I do want to do uh, Doctrine 401 through 410. And if we can get that done by the end of October, we'll, uh, we'll be good. So we got some flexibility as far as when we start that in August. And uh, we're just staying flexible, hopefully, if uh, you guys can stay flexible with me. But May 23rd, I'll be out of town with my lovely bride for our 30th anniversary. And then um, we're also trying to, no, it's not, well, it might be Pentecost, but <laughs> yeah, probably is Pentecost. But no, it's my 30th wedding anniversary and Sharon and I are going out of town. So uh, we'll have that Sunday away. Then as far as August is concerned, we're just trying to get a, a sense of when Aletheia might be graduating. So there might be a possibility if they loosen their COVID restrictions in Florida, that, um, or if the Navy loosens their COVID restrictions, then we'll maybe get to go and, uh, and watch her graduation ceremony. So praying for that. All right, well, let's, uh, let's get into our material. Let's open with prayer. Welcome everybody. Let's. Uh, Let's commit this to the Lord and then start going through it, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the blessing we have to study to show ourselves approved. I thank you for the doctrinal topics that are represented in this lesson today. And we ask for your blessing as we search the scriptures and see if these things are so. Open our eyes, open our ears, and, and soften our hearts, Father, as we as we look to the truth of your word. We thank you, we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so in Doctrine 301, we got, uh, I got to keep an eye on the clock because we've got five topics. And if I spend the whole time on bitterness, then we'll, we'll be out of time to cover freedom, friendships, the heavenlies, and refreshment. So those five topics we got to keep an eye on to cover between now and five o'clock. 90 minutes to run through five topics, plus we want to save time at the end for some Q&A. So um, let's pick up here with bitterness. Make my screen slightly larger. Make sure we hit all the quiz questions. Bitterness, one of the most crushing mental problems of a person's life. And yeah, we get the, the tremendous example of the Exodus generation and the, the waters of Mara. And we want to learn from that so that we don't follow and uh, commit the same sin that they committed, that sin of bitterness, uh, causes a loss of many of the blessings of the normal Christian life. And, uh, and, and they're just, it's not necessary. We end up throwing away all these blessings that we should have in the, the freedom and the friendship and all the other blessings we're supposed to be having in the Christian walk. And, uh, and we lose it all. We throw it all away because we harbor the bitterness instead. And uh, the, what you cultivate is what you're going to get more of. So when we cult, end up cultivating the bitterness, we're going to get more of it. So we want to root it out. We want to replace it with the fruit of the spirit. Um, anyway, we'll get we'll get to the verses here uh, in the process of this class. But my favorite one is that 
one that warns about the root of bitterness. And I, I like the emphasis on the root so that we can dig it out early before it, uh, before it sprouts. So uh, devastating mental attitude sin triggers a wide range of other sins. It's almost, I, I think it's probably second to pride that I think pride triggers more sins than anything else. And maybe bitterness is a, is a close second to that. And, and really, they go hand in hand. I think a lot of times bitterness is itself a pride application because we get discontent with God and we think that we deserve better. And all that is is just a pride expression. But yeah, bitterness can trigger the hatred and cruelty and the, the items that you see on the list here. It is neither consistent nor rational. <laughs> so it doesn't do you any good to point out any inconsistencies or hypocrisy or anything like that because it's it's just not productive. And likewise, rationality, if you try to approach a bitter person with a logical doctrinal uh, thing, and sometimes that goes over like a lead balloon, uh, it's not a rational issue anyway. So um, yeah, you end up with just compounding the issue a lot of times when you approach them. And then Proverbs addresses that. When you uh, bring wisdom to the fool, a lot of times um, they just they just turn and it makes it makes it much worse. So um, anyway, the good objective in this article provide believers with a, a thorough look at what the Bible says about bitterness, and hopefully when we can spotlight it for what it is, you know, do this. This is the kind of study you want to do in fellowship, obviously. Uh, do this in between your your struggles. Um, if you find that bitterness happens to be a sin that you struggle with, then uh, in between those those particular uh, bouts of, of bitterness, uh, get yourself a good calm in fellowship moment and really really go through this text read it pray over it uh plead to the lord uh, in, in fervent prayer to to root that bitterness out so that uh, that our episodes can i say our episodes uh, mine and yours each one of us as we struggle with this can uh, we can make sure that these uh these bouts become fewer and uh, and farther between so um Good definitions here, English language definitions and Greek and Hebrew definitions. Uh, of course, bitter related to a taste, um, then uh, we can take that metaphor and apply it to our life circumstances, whereby we're not literally eating anything, but some things we face in life are just tough to swallow, you know, and different events and experiences and, and uh, issues with people <coughs> end up being tough to swallow. So. Bitter defeats, bitter losses, bitter uh, relationships, all kinds of bitter experiences that we can have in, in BIOS life. Uh, Picross and compound terms related to Picross and Picria and, uh, and other expressions there that are used in the New Testament really speak of how sharp things are, a sharpness that pokes and goads and hurts. So good summary of the vocabulary there. And then the classic text in the Old Testament with uh, Mara, the Hebrew word for bitter. Could not drink the waters of Mara for they were bitter, therefore they was named Mara. Uh, Naomi in the book of Ruth discusses this. She doesn't want to be called pleasant. She wants to be called bitter. <laughs> and I guess, um, yeah, Naomi means pleasant, Mara means bitter. So give her credit for that. At least she's uh, she's she's claiming it, <laughs> naming it and claiming it, going uh, full uh, open on her bitterness, taking it by name. Uh, good reference in Habakkuk. Seven instances in the New Testament, as Peter wept bitterly. But we had it in uh, Colossians, and here it is in Ephesians. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. I don't see the Colossians reference there. I guess husbands love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Colossians 3.19. Okay, it's a verb form, picrino. So yeah, that would be a cognate verb form that goes with the noun and the adjective that uh, that we have in our lesson here. 
if you have bitter envy, this is James 3, 14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Either bitter jealousy or bitter envy, either way, it's the sharpness of that bitterness. Hmm. All right, Bible examples of bitterness, of course, Hannah and her rival that we read about in 1 Samuel, Proverbs 17, grief to his father, bitterness to her who bore him, that's the foolish son. And really, the foolishness of that hits in the adult life after they were grown and gone, raised, and they're, they're beyond spanking, they're beyond uh, the correction, and it's, uh, it's, it's just hurts to see the, the poor choices that are made in, in those circumstances. Lamentations, not, not a surprise there. Amos. Amos is the text where we have the, uh, the famine for doctrine. And uh, that's the very next verse there after Amos 8.10. Um, I will turn your festivals into mourning, your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on everyone's loins and baldness on every head. I'll make it a time of mourning for an only son. The end of it will be like a bitter day. That's on a national basis. That's a horrible judgment. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I'll send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. And um, I, know, I suspect our nation is in this famine right now, given the, the, um, the Barna survey I saw this morning and the, the other issues where most of uh, churchianity today, American Christendom today, is all about the moralistic therapeutic deism and, and not at all about um, the, uh, the, the verse by verse doctrinal study of the Word of God. Anyway, Isaiah 33, 2 Kings 14, excellent passages related to bitterness. So, um, things that women, I don't want to miss these bullet points. Women can become bitter for family reasons. Um, a foolish son can be bitterness. Divine discipline on a nation. These are all the things that can trigger bitterness. Slavery. Personal sufferings. Now keep in mind, all of these things that can cause bitterness don't have to. A believer can, can respond by faith rest, can claim the promises, can walk in the light, keep their eyes fixed on the Lord. Um, and ideally, that's uh, that's where we want to be. When we start seeing the answers to bitterness, we're going to see these uh, these solutions that happen here. All right, lamentations again, not a surprise. Pride, consummate human pride, is a cause of bitterness. That'll be on your quiz if you haven't done your quiz yet. Acts from Acts eight twenty three. Now this one is curious to me because when you read through Acts eight. Um, I don't know. I think we can we can discuss how pri how much pride is present here in the hands of uh, or in uh, Simon's attitude. Peter does rebuke him and says, "May your silver perish. You have no part or portion in this matter. Your heart is not right before God." And I, and I think it's correct that we can properly identify that as a pride issue. But still, it is open to interpretation, and I think it would be a worthwhile consideration that um, it would be more obvious if the, if I found the word pride in here, I found an expression here as it relates to pride. But uh, the heart that's not right, um, I think it's correct that we can identify that as pride, but it's more implicit than explicit, if that makes sense. So repent of this wickedness of yours and pray. That you may be forgiven. And it does say you're in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity. All right. So, anyway, that is an answer to your quiz question uh, in terms of pride of Acts 8 23. Um, so, I don't want you to miss that. Degeneracy. And isn't that sad? Yeah. Here's the, the fully degenerate, and uh, they think it's going to make them fun, all the flagrant sinning and all the other wickedness they're pursued in. and it doesn't provide any happiness. They're just more bitter than they've ever been before. Even uh, 
as they live this life of defiance against the word of God. Worldly involvement. And this is where I think we do need to be, uh, as it says, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, be put away from you along with all malice. Um, again, there's a larger context to that, I think, that would make the case for worldly involvement. But I think um, that's more, again, implicit rather than explicit in, uh, in Ephesians 4. And here's the text for husbands and wives. Yes, Colossians 3.19. Love your wives, do not be embittered against them or bitter towards them. All right. So let's say we fail and we allow ourselves to plunge into bitterness. And then, like I say, we nurture that, we, we feed that, and it just it begets worse and worse. And so uh, the consequences go downhill from there. And good passages there from Proverbs, from Jeremiah. And it really is self-deceptive. You end up lying to yourself in that bitterness. Job chapter 9. Of course, he had a ton of bitterness. Remember, he didn't sin in the first two chapters, but he sins very quickly when he starts defending himself and justifying himself. Uh, and then when he starts countering the lies of his adversaries is when he really crosses a line and assigns wickedness to God. So um, anyway, you can see some of that by as early as chapter nine. Motivates complaining, whereas faith motivates lamentation and claiming the promises. The difference between grumbling and lamentation is uh, whether you're in fellowship or out of fellowship and whether you're claiming the promises of scripture, even when you cite your difficulties. It is a grace deficiency. I, I would agree with that. Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. So it's a deficiency. You know, we're already past the point when it says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then we're told to not fall short of the grace of God uh, as an experiential sanctification issue in the book of Hebrews. And when we do fall short of the grace of God, then, man, it seems like bitterness is the first stop on that train wreck. So, uh, Anyway, we, we dealt with that to some uh, extent in, in the Hebrew series not long ago. How do we recover from bitterness? Well, you know, of course, confession of sin puts you back in fellowship, but I think there is ongoing damage that we do in the bitterness that we have to retrain our thinking, that we have to readjust our, our attitude. And so we do definitely need to more than just confession of sin. I think it requires uh, a prolonged uh, fellowship with Jesus Christ and re, retraining of the uh, renewing of the mind in the, in the word of God so that uh, we don't just keep returning to that first gut reaction, you know, or that that instinctive response is always the bitterness that uh, that it would be in our carnality. But yeah, start with a confession of sin, maintain a prolonged filling of the Holy Spirit. The longer you're filled, the more you're filled then uh, you're diminishing those bitterness uh, engagements. You want those bouts to be, so it's like, almost like a, I don't know how to describe it, but each episode just can be stronger than the one before if you keep feeding it and keep going back to it. Living in the word of God, constantly studying and meditating on the Bible, not just once a week when you're in church, but daily, consistently have a daily reading plan, have a consistent Bible time, have a consistent prayer time, just have a consistent time of meditating on what you've read and, and heard throughout the day. That's what true meditation is all about. And it's cleansing. It's mind cleansing. You can give your mind a bath <laughs> by living in the word of God. Orientation to grace. We saw already Hebrews 12. There it is still on the screen, coming short of the grace of God. So, um, yeah, and maybe if you have more and more bitterness, just ask yourself, use that as a red flag and say, uh, you know, I, maybe I need more grace, I need to express more grace, I need to be more gracious to others. Find some active grace opportunities so that uh, you're not constantly turning to bitterness every time. Occupation with Christ. One of the things I recommend to you, let me just say one more thing about this. Um, in the past, I have counseled um or offered advice 
to folks to take a take a, a 30 day sabbatical of of um, just quit praying for yourself for 30 days um, put a put a moratorium on your own person uh, as a prayer object and just uh, spend 30 days praying for other people and uh, just give yourself a complete ban for any of your self prayers and, and allow uh, allow your brothers and sisters in the church to you know well, we got your back we've got you covered there's other people praying for you so um, you don't really have to pray for yourself really so take 30 days and, and never mention yourself even once uh, your your health your your problems your finances your uh, your jerk of a boss or I mean whatever it is if, 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 if it's something that has a connection to you then don't pray about it just let it go and and become truly become a, an intercessor on behalf of uh, people other than yourself and 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 it's remarkable um, the uh, the benefit that has to our grace provisions um, come to some prayer meetings join in other people's prayer items and and uh, I recommend that all right occupation with Christ rather than occupation with yourself trusting in God and claiming the promises the great faith rest life that we've had in previous classes uh, praise and thanksgivings yeah, you can offer those yeah those that's not it's just as long as it's not the the petitions and the intercessions and the pleadings and the, the i need i need i need and the absorption about what i don't have good question on that all right relax mental attitude all right so that wraps up bitterness any questions on bitterness the um what we're not going to do is we're not going to do the uh Eastern Orthodox routine, where if you if you go to Kiev um, and and go to the to the uh, Lavra, they've got a they've got a monastery, and uh, you go to the church, the biggest church in Kiev, and the the Lavra monastery has catacombs underneath it, and um, they have a fully indexed list of monks that uh, that you can go to. So bitterness will be one. Um, I'd have to look it up on the website, but one of their monks uh really has victory over bitterness and uh they recommend that you uh make a pilgrimage to that monk's uh, burial site and uh, you can show your uh devotion to the lord and your your reverence before this monk and uh, of course you pay the fee and the more you pay the more reverence you're showing and uh and then you travel to his um you travel to his tomb that shows even more reverence because you took the time and the effort and the finances to make a pilgrimage and then you will go down into the catacombs that takes even more devotion and and today is the best day for this because it's orthodox easter and and right i'm telling you today that temple uh, that that church is packed there are thousands of people there um maybe not in the age of covid maybe they're limiting things but i tell you there are people there and they are they are going to pray they're going to show homage to a monk because they believe that the saints that have gone before us they now just like jesus ever lives to make intercession they believe that uh, the virgin mother and all the other departed saints that they ever live to make intercession so uh, if you properly honor the the right monk then uh, he will pray for you and uh and he'll get you through your your bitterness <laughs> or, or your lust or your greed or whatever uh whatever your hang up is uh, if you've got a particular besetting sin they've got a monk for you and uh it's, uh, it's just a horrible thing so anyway i'm glad that uh, that didn't show up anywhere here in these uh, solutions to bitterness in uh, the grace notes curriculum and that's a good thing all right any final questions on bitterness we can move on and look to freedom and i love this the liberty that we have in christ and this this was a great theme that we developed in uh, in galatians it was for freedom that christ set you free uh i wouldn't trade being a church age believer for any any other dispensation before or since i i, I think even after the church age uh, the millennium is going to be great the uh the thousand generations of the fullness of times is going to be great um, but I wouldn't trade either of those uh, for the position we have in Christ. We are the uh, the royal family of God, the body of believers in union with the uh, the heir of all things. So 
Um, anyway, we've got an amazing freedom in Christ and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And when you contrast the two laws, um, Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of Moses was nothing but condemnation. The law of Moses was, was all about death, 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 death for this, that, and everything else. And nobody measured up. And uh, But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So here's our contrast. And this is the great freedom that we have. We're saved and we have an amazing freedom in the church age. The liberty and grace to, uh, to um, have a, a glorious Zoe life and then a free Bios life in, uh, in what we do. Uh, so I hope everybody's clear uh, on the two words for, uh, for life. There's Zoe life, Z-O-E, and there's Bios life, B-I-O-S. And uh, don't confuse those, those two different lives that we have. And uh, this is a, a great freedom that we have. All right. So if you, uh, <laughs> if you were a salesperson and these were the two products you were to sell, which could you find a buyer for? Yeah. Yeah, good luck trying to sell sin and death. Um, the law of the spirit of life. It's a higher principle. And I do like it. I, I do agree that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the freedom that we have in the church age. And so James, when James referenced the perfect law, the law of liberty, um, I'm fine with that. It's a great linkage uh, between James 1.25 and, uh, and Romans 8.2. Because again, it's the... Let me put those side by side. James 1.25 and uh, Romans 8.2. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. So the action of that law is one that is, is a, an action of freedom. It's an action of liberty. So I don't have any problem with um, identifying the Romans 8.2 law with the James 1.25 law. That's the perfect law, the law of liberty. And, uh, and, and there's happiness in that. It's not the uh, eulogetos happiness. It's the makariot happiness of blessing. Also, uh, James 2.8. James 2.8. Called the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And again, um, would James be introducing an entirely different law there? Is James, uh, I think James is referencing the same law that he referenced in chapter one uh, when he comes back to that theme in chapter two. Um, and I don't have any problem either identifying the royal law as the perfect law, the law of liberty, as the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So I think all of those terms are very interrelatable, and uh, and I'm fine um, drawing a, a parallel between them. I have seen pastors that have have, have um, made distinctions between them, and they've, they've categorized them in different ways. And so if you encounter that, I think John Eichmann and other pastors have kind of reclassified them as separate laws. But um, anyway, I won't get into that today. I do. I do. Uh, accept all three of those as being e equivalents one of another i'm going to nitpick us slightly with with the uh the second corinthians passage that we have coming up so stay tuned on that um and sadly that's the one that, that is on your quiz question <laughs> the one where i where i nitpick all right uh hebrews talks about the better hope and I don't have any problem with that as well. Let me close these and make more Bible room here. Hebrews 7, 18 and 19. On the one hand, there's the setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing per uh, perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And um, this, this here is not called a law. It's not called the law of freedom or the, uh, the law of liberty or the royal law. Um, but it is called a better hope, and, and I think it well describes our present approach in the church age. It's also describing the future approach of Israel 
in uh, the tribulation and in the millennial kingdom. So anyway, if you want more on Hebrews, we've got uh, the completed Hebrew series on the website there. All right, in 2 Corinthians 3, 3, we find where this law is written. And uh, you need to know this because it is on your quiz. Uh, it's not written on tablets of stone. Uh, the, uh, the law of liberty, the perfect law, the royal law, the, um, the operating system of grace that we live in is, uh, is not written on tablets. However, I think we've got to be cautious. Um, Yeah, so I don't want you to get your quiz question wrong. When the quiz asks you, where is the uh, the law uh, written? The answer is uh, on your heart in, in 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. However, uh, this would be a quiz question I would hope to rewrite in the next, uh, the next edition of Grace Notes. Uh, because in the context of 2 Corinthians 3, I don't see that law. I don't see the law of liberty. I don't see the royal law, um, any of those other expressions are not there, nor is there a parallel expression there. Uh, when Paul is talking about his own credentials, his own um, portfolio of, of credentials as an apostle, he says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? So this is about uh, how people view us and our ministries and whether or not we would be accepted in a lampstand somewhere um you know is there a church that would that would accept my credentials for example and, and consider me a valid candidate for a, a pulpit opening um or would they reject my qualifications because they're looking for um accredited uh seminary degrees or they're looking for a phd after the person's name or they're looking for something else and so um, what Paul says here is, you are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. And so this is where I really have to disagree with a quiz question, because it's not the royal law that's written on hearts. It's the Corinthian believers themselves. The Corinthian believers, they are the ones written on Paul's heart. Uh, Paul and, and his team, those that are writing this, uh, those that ministered and served them, written in our hearts and then read by all men and so i can i can apply this to austin bible church austin bible church is my letter of commendation uh, each member of austin bible church is written on my heart uh, as i have taught and served and shepherded and bloodshed and tear uh, you know blood sweat and tears and, and everything else and as it's written on my heart it can be read by all men because my heart is transparent before all men in uh, in this being manifested that you are a letter of christ cared for by us written not with ink but with the spirit of the living god not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts and again it's not the royal law that's being written here it's you you are a letter of christ so it's the believers in Corinth that are being addressed here. That is the, um, not, the, not the royal law or the law of liberty um, that this lesson is dealing with. So anyway, that's my quibble. That's my uh, dispute. And uh, we'll see if we can get that uh, quiz question rewritten or just get this, basically get that paragraph removed from the next, uh, the next edition. All right. Normally laws are regulative and controlling, but ours is a, a law of freedom. Uh, it's, a, it's a rule of thumb. <laughs> it's a guideline than a rule. And it, uh, it is. And, the, and the, the rule of thumb is freedom and grace. And say, uh, you know, what would freedom and grace say in this circumstance? That's, that's, our, uh, that's our judge. If we uh, if we make our decisions based on freedom and grace, then we're consistent with uh, this church age law that we're under. All right. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So I guess that's the connection that folks try to make in verse 17, taking it way back to writing on the heart there, in uh, in verses two and three. So there is liberty in the chapter. Just later on 
All right, James 4. Does scripture speak to no purpose? <laughs> no, scripture does not speak to no purpose. There's a reason why we have a New Testament, the reason why we have a grace, uh, a, a Greek canon uh, side by side with our Hebrew canon. We want to walk in freedom. He was for freedom that Christ set us free. So, uh, yeah, we want to be led by the spirit, not by the law, certainly not by the flesh. And it's interesting to me the way that the, the law and flesh team up and work together, whereas grace and the Holy Spirit serve on the other side to keep us free. All right. Hopefully I'm not going too quickly on this. Romans 6 and 7. These are great chapters. Uh, Pastor Dan touched on this a little bit. Um, he was really focused on 9 through 11, but he did bring in uh, 6 through 8 on, uh, as part of the background for that. Um, there's really such a freedom in Christ. And it's Paul even uses the language of death and widowhood as an illustration for um why it's so unthinkable that a, a church age believer priest would subject himself back to the bondage of the law because it's just as unthinkable as uh as a widow still being bound by uh marriage vows when uh when their spouse uh has died when their spouse is in heaven um you're freed from from that marriage vow you're free from the uh, the restrictions of of the marriage life that you had up till that point and um and uh trying to remain in bondage after that freedom is uh is unthinkable so anyway paul uses that illustration here in romans 6 and 7 to uh to talk about that you know what a death has taken place here how can we who died to sin still live in sin we should have this freedom he who has died is freed from sin so if we're dead to sin, why are we still enslaved by it? Anyway, good illustrations on that. Uh, that will be on your quiz as well. Romans 6, 7. He who has died is freed from sin. All right, good verses that describe our freedom. And we can personally identify with this and live this life of freedom the world at large though is still waiting uh, and of course most of the world is in unbelief anyway but creation is waiting to be set free from its bondage into the uh, freedom of the glory of the children of god so that's a uh, that's a curious thing to me too and i think some people are trying to apply this today rather than looking forward to the return of jesus christ at second advent and realizing that the kingdom can't be here until the king returns and uh, the transformative effect we're going to have christ is going to have on this world uh, won't even start until the millennium and even at the end of the millennium is still going to have opposition and resentment and hatred so the gog magog revolt is at the end of the thousand years which shows you that uh, even with perfect environment the uh, sinners of the millennium are going to struggle against uh, having christ ruling in jerusalem I like 1 Corinthians 10, 29. Why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? And uh, this is what happens. Not only, I think, sadly, not only are, are legalists actively imposing their, their standards on other people, but I think non-legalists still struggle because they want to, they don't want to rock the boat or they want to, they want to measure up in somebody else's eyes and, and, why are we even doing that? We, we're called to freedom and we stand before the Lord and he's the one we answer to, not somebody else's conscience. So, uh, you know, don't take any action in Bios life just because somebody else is doing it. That's, uh, that's the lemming approach. That's not what we're here for. <laughs> okay. We should have such a freedom in our Zoe life that we can be relaxed about our Bios life and anything that we're doing in our Bios life can be a reflection of the, the liberty that we have in our Zoe life. So. Uh, and that's that's a glorious truth that's uh it's a marvelous freedom that we have so uh, we're not looking down our noses and judging other people certainly not over the bios issues that are that are left to the discretionary will of god anyway 
All right, Galatians 5, 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free, but don't be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Yeah, you can't disguise sin under the, the banner of liberty and say, well, I'm free to, I'm free to do whatever. That's, that's antinomianism. That's not grace, liberty in Christ. So it's not an opportunity for the flesh, but through love to serve one another. Appreciate that. Because remember, sin is still sin. Liberty doesn't cancel out sin. But we can't cause stumbling blocks to the weak. That you may be enjoying a liberty just perfectly fine. and uh, But you've got a weak brother watching what you're doing. And he doesn't have the same liberty you have. So you got to give him time to grow up. And you've got to be, uh, you got to have discernment towards him. You don't want to be that stumbling block. In the Zoe life or the Bios life. First Peter, act as free men. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. That's so true. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. This is this is marvelous. This is not about getting saved. This is about somebody who already is saved, being a disciple, growing in the Word of God, and having the tremendous freedom of a doctrinal orientation to uh, to Zoe life. Appreciate that. These false teachers are all about corruption. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. All right. Anyway, the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. All right. Let me give you a rule. If you, if as you are progressing in your spiritual life, you are moving to greater bondage and law, there's a problem. <laughs> and I would agree. If, however, you're moving towards greater freedom and grace, you're on the right track. That's right. That's why we're commanded to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know an awful lot of believers that, that grow in tons and tons of doctrine, but uh, not so much grace. And it's sad. Oh, and grace is listed first, that we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right. Again, this is functional. Positional freedom was the issue in Romans 6. Now we are into living the spiritual life. Yeah, this is, we start with the Zoe life. We start with the spiritual. So uh, anyway. How are we doing on time? We're doing well. We've still got uh, friendships, heavenlies, and refreshment coming up. We've covered two of our five topics, the longest of the two of the five topics. These other ones are shorter, so we're, we're doing fine. Um, let me just make sure you guys know what I'm talking about with respect to, not that. There we go. All right, there's your Zoe life. Z-O-E, Strong's number is 2222. And then Bios, number 979. I wanted to make sure that we had both of those. Zoe life and Bios life. Zoe life and Bios life. Bios is Strong's number 979, and Zoe is Strong's number 2222. And so I think um, maintaining that distinction is highly useful because um, we all have different BIOS lives. We all have different walks of life and different careers and different things. And, you know, um, our, our, uh, just think of temporal life. Think of, of uh, anything that's temporal in time. So, you know, if you live in a, an apartment or a house or a condo or a, an RV or a houseboat, or a tent or wherever you're under a bridge somewhere wherever you live that's just bios life okay um you're you're a doctor a lawyer an indian chief whatever your career path is you're a ditch digger you're a brain surgeon all of that is your is your bios life and uh the food you like to eat the vacations you like to take the the clothes you wear i mean all that that's just earthly stuff the kingdom of god is not eating and drinking 
okay? So don't separate out Bios life with, with uh, don't confuse that with Zoe life and uh, the spiritual life that we have, the eternal life that we have in Christ. That's, uh, that's, what, that's what we need to be focused on. That's where we start. Our freedom starts there. If we don't have freedom in Zoe life, then uh, it's not going to have any reflections in, uh, in Bios life. Anyway, I'm, I'm really burdened by this, and uh, you're going to see some more references to this in some upcoming newsletters, and uh, you're going to hear some more references to this in uh, upcoming classes. So just think Zoe is 2222 and BIOS is 979. Kind of neat. They're both FM roads around Austin. We can track based on a map where FM 2222 goes or FM 979 goes. And one of those is Zoe Life and one of those is BIOS Life. All right. Let's close that. So any questions on freedom? Don't want to abuse liberty. This is where I think I've seen an awful lot of believers kind of pervert grace. Um, we can't pervert grace. We can't turn grace into an excuse for licentiousness. Uh, that's the that's the snare in Jude. I didn't see Jude 3 mentioned in this text. Jude. Oh, there we go. Yeah, Jude, these creeps that come in in verse 4. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. That's terrible. When, you, when you're perverting freedom, when you're, when you're uh, perverting grace, turning it into licentiousness, you're denying our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is a person that throws off Mosaic law and just becomes a law unto themselves instead of submitting to the, uh, the law of liberty in Christ that we're, that we're placed under. All right, so yeah, add Jude 4 to your, to your notes there for liberty. All right, friendships. I enjoyed this very much. This is going to go quickly because uh, there are not a lot of quiz questions on here. There's not a lot of Bible in here either. Um, uh, but it is it's a good study. Uh, I would recommend maybe expanding it a little bit, finding some biblical examples, David and Jonathan or other uh, friendship illustrations that we have. Uh, Abraham was called a friend of God. I think there's there's other verses we can we can insert into this. Um, anyway, I do, I do enjoy this. It's very practical that we can, for example, the first step in solving this problem is to recognize every person we meet is someone that God is working with. And, uh, and that's true. If they're an unbeliever, then God's working with them to bring them to the gospel. If they're a believer, then God's working with them to bring them to uh, discipleship. And if they're a disciple, then God's working with them to bring them to maturity. So God is at work with everybody on the planet today. Um, might need to flesh that out a bit, expand upon that, do some uh, do some research and find some Bible verses to put into there. Because I don't, there's no scripture passages in uh, in these paragraphs here. Um, every time we meet someone, the Lord has a purpose in the encounter. Can I, can I prove that biblically? Um, well, the sovereignty of God we can find and. Uh, in all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your steps. That if you're in God's will, you're where he wants you at every moment. And uh, we can consider every divine encounter. Anyway, this is, this this will be worthy of an essay, perhaps. Worthy of, uh, of uh, some rhetorical questions that sometimes answer themselves. So uh, can this be abused? Can this become problematic? Can we, um, um, can we, do we carry this too far sometimes? Oh, interested to hear a response at the end of the hour if we uh, open this up to discussion. So if, if every person is a divine encounter, does that mean if I'm in the checkout lane of the grocery store that I have to give that checkout clerk the uh, the gospel, or I'm failing in my divine encounter here if I don't uh, give them the gospel as I'm checking you out in the grocery lane. Those are the kind of things I 
I like to explore with people. All right, degrees of friendship. This is useful as well. But I highlight the fact that this is coming from uh, from Bill Gothard. Um, I'd be curious. I don't have that book. Institu uh, I don't have the uh, Gothard material. Maybe he's got scripture for this that uh, didn't make it into the Grace Notes edition. Um, but according to Gothard, uh, there are four levels of friendship, acquaintance, casual friend, close friend, intimate friend. And I, I think we can find illustrations for all of those classifications in the Bible. But I think mostly this text is just kind of approaching it as we experience things in our BIOS life. Each level has its distinguishing characteristics, responsibilities, appropriate questions, controversial topics that can be followed. Now, and I think these are useful guidelines, um, but I would like to see more scripture applied. And I would want to be cautious with respect to some of this as well. I'll explain what I mean by that here shortly. So an acquaintance is a person with whom you've only occasional contact. Yeah, someone you meet while traveling, one who comes to your house to fix the plumbing or washing machine, somebody that you probably never see again for the rest of your life unless, you know, God brings it about another time. Um, develop as far as possible in the time that you have. And I think the big difference here too, what, what, what I think about in terms of these degrees of friendships, I also think, what are my duties um, as a believer in the church? Who am I accountable for? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am my brother's keeper, but it's my brothers and sisters in Austin Bible Church. We're the ones that I'm responsible to uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction in the issues there. Yeah, yeah, that Augustine quote, I've seen that before. I think Valerie's very fond of that Augustine quote. Um, anyway, um, obviously the acquaintance is not a close friend, not an intimate friend. You're not gonna pour out your soul to a, to a stranger, to an acquaintance. Uh, I think, um, you know, the stranger isn't even on this list, okay? Uh, the enemy is not on this list, I, I think. Um, there's a there's a there's the issues of the angelic conflict that are not featured at all in the the doctrine of friendship here. So, um, you know, I, I think some people that might be referred to as an acquaintance in this in this lesson, I wouldn't even call them an acquaintance. I would I would call them a, a stranger, and uh, I would call stranger danger. <laughs> and until I know them, until I make their acquaintance. Uh, that I don't know if they're saved or lost, if they're if they are uh, Satan worshippers or what they are. We live behind enemy lines. We live in a fallen world, and uh, we better be aware of that. So be alert to each person you meet. Be cheerful and friendly, uh, but at the same time, as we say uh, in the military, uh, you know, be ready to kill them. <laughs> be locked and loaded. Be armed. Be ready to know that this acquaintance may actually be a, an adversary, ready to stab you and and uh, understand, have discernment, be shrewd as serpents, yet harmless as doves. So, uh, yeah, have a plan to kill everyone you meet. That was uh, General uh, Mattis' motto. Learn the person's name and remember it, and then use his name in conversation once in a while. So uh, we had a visitor at church today named Helen. And how am I going to remember Helen? Helen, Helen, Helen. I'm going to remember Helen because of either Helen of Troy or um true lies when arnold schwarzenegger is crossing the street saying helen 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 uh when he finds out that she's uh having an affair anyway not fair to our visitor named helen um but i'm going to use that to remember her name is helen next time i see her anyway be a good listener avoid talking about yourself this is all good I mean, this is all practical bios wisdom here I don't, I don't dispute any of this. I'm, I hope I'm not too critical of this material, but um, this is, just seems to be practical BIOS stuff as opposed to, I'm still looking for my first Bible verse in uh, in this section. I'm not going to find any. Then there's casual friendships based on common interests or activities, you know, people at the Scrabble Club or whatever. And uh, because you share those mutual interests, you have various conversations with different folks. But still, you can be out of bounds real quickly in this realm. Your scribble friend may not want you to be preaching at them all the time. 
close friendships. And then each we get closer and cl we get fewer and fewer people in each of these categories. You have fewer close friends than you have for uh, friends, casual friends or uh, acquaintances. And then obviously the intimate friendship is the, the smallest circle of all. All right, anyway, that's that. And we get to the end of that. And uh, the only quiz question came at the very early part of the lesson. The first step in solving this problem is to recognize every person we meet is someone that God is working with. That will be on your quiz. All right, any comments, thoughts, questions, issues with, with that? Looks like we still have 14 connected. But we have a caller. All right. That's probably Cornelius. He's often a caller. Elvis is with us. I haven't seen some of these arrivals here. All right. Well, then I'm just going to keep going. The heavenlies. We're going to talk about the heavenlies and we got to talk about refreshment. So, two more topics to go. And the heavenlies, this is more than just simply a place we're going when we die. We actually function there presently. We are a heavenly citizenship. We are a heavenly people. We, our blessings are in the heavenly places. Our, uh, our marketplace is in the heavenly places. Uh, our banking uh, deposits are in the heavenly places. And our banking withdrawals are in the heavenly places. Uh, our combat is in the heavenly places. So um, we, have, um, we have to deal with this. All right, I did get a pop-up question just now. Rudy wants to know, where does Philippians 2.20? fit in the previous section <laughs> no that's okay no, sorry too slow no i'm too fast um yeah no one else of kindred spirit who will generally be concerned for your welfare i think i think this speaks to a like-minded um a soul priority that that paul and timothy have similar to what david and paul uh, david and uh, jonathan had a real like-mindedness of spiritual life priorities and um uh, I wouldn't call that a, a friendship per se. I, I would. They were they were of one soul, one spirit. I think it's isopsukas. Yeah, isopsukas. There. Yeah, good question. I appreciate that. All right, the heavenlies. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I love that. And for the people that that try to get put themselves under Mosaic laws, if they can try to work for mosaic blessings why why would you work for mosaic blessings uh, they were finite they were earthly they weren't for you anyway and uh, instead of legalistically working for mosaic blessings how about if we in freedom and liberty and grace uh, enjoy the heavenly blessings that we don't have to work for we've already been given them in the heavenly places in christ we have this portfolio up front and we can appreciate that the heavenlies is the locale of the Lord's success in spiritual warfare against Satan. And that's where his victory is. That's where our victory is. We can enjoy this. So all of these headings here, I kind of want to pay attention to. The heavenlies is the location of divine blessings. So if you're wrapped up about earthly blessings, bios blessings, you want uh, a hot car and all the money and, and uh you know, a beautiful wife or all this other stuff. If you want just earthly stuff, that's earthly stuff. The Bible's talking about heavenly blessings, spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. And that's what we're called to in uh, Ephesians 1, 3. And it's the locale of the Lord's success in spiritual warfare. Psalm 103, verse 19. And uh, the location of our position in Christ. So uh, we're seated at the Father's right hand, even as Christ is seated at the Father's right hand. Notice Hebrews 2, 6, raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Isn't that glorious? That's our position. That's why we have the freedom and the grace that we have. It's also where the angels are watching us. The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. So they get to report, and as we see in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, every now and then they, they stand and they report. You know, have you considered my servant, uh, Pastor Bob? Ooh, tremble, okay? 
And it's where our battlefield is, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So the emphasis on the heavenly. We live on earth, our bios life is on earth, but our zoe life is heavenly. And we, uh, we need to realize that, that down here we're just pilgrims and strangers. We're aliens, this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Good reminder there on the heavenlies. I would add to it as well, um, Revelation chapter three, and uh, the message to Laodicea. He says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. So this is where, if we're buying from Jesus Christ and he's seated at the right hand of God, buy from me uh, gold refined by fire, that you may become rich, white garments, you may be clothe yourself. The shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. The point of these items is that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And everything that's wrong with them in Zoe life can be remedied by the Lord, but you gotta go to him and make that purchase, make all the purchases uh, from the clothing, the, the eye salve, the gold, everything that you need in Zoe life you uh, you get it from from Jesus Christ. You go and you buy from Him. So that's our heavenly marketplace that we engage in. We're not just making deposits in heaven; we're making purchases in heaven. So uh, yeah, go buy the gold refined by fire. Jesus is waiting to give it to you. And it's not cash on delivery; it's grace on delivery. I love that. All right, any questions on the heavenlies? Give the slow typers opportunity to type in the chat window. All right, ready for some refreshment. Our fifth topic is refreshment. Again, it's uh, it's in Zoe life. It's in the spiritual realm, the heavenly places. It's all about. Um, there might be a reflection of it in Bios life. Um, but the, the true refreshments in the spiritual life. So anapao, to rest, to give the land a rest. You know, in uh, in the Old Testament, they had to rotate their crops and they have to have the Sabbath year was designed to give the land its rest. But for us, we have the spiritual rest in Christ and refreshing rest in your company. And Paul found tremendous rest when he was fellowshipping with other brothers and sisters in various places. And that's where he would find his refreshment, refreshing rest in your company. That's Romans 15, 32. This is why, too, I think it's useful that we have in the local church that we do have um, all of the Acts 2.42 activities. So we have doctrine, we have communion, we have um, uh, prayer. But that fellowship application, the breaking of bread, the... the um, I think I'm misquoting Acts 2.42. Continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. So there we are. We, st we, we start with Bible class. We teach 230 times a year. We're solid on our doctrine. We're making sure that believers are grounded in truth. But that's not the only item. There's fellowship. There's the breaking of bread. There's prayer. And I think the, uh, I think this is communion. Um, but then the fellowship. We want to make sure that we have appropriate fellowship times. Well, we have potlucks, we have socials, we have other occasions. We had last week we had a just a, a, a short gathering for uh, for James uh, uh, Benson and his 90th birthday. These these fellowship times are important because these fellowship times not only are they structured for a local church's benefit, but they are exactly what Romans 15 is talking about the refreshing rest as provided by the company of the uh of the saints the company of the saints all right first corinthians 16 in fact you can have whole ministries devoted to this stephanus fortunatus Arche archaicus they have supplied what was lacking on your part they have a whole ministry devoted to this i think uh the household of stephanus is mentioned a few verses earlier verse 15 they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints. That's the entire household. Stephanus and his household made this a family business, that they were all about ministering to the saints and, 
in uh, realms of refreshment and refresh my spirit in yours. So acknowledge such men. That's a ministry. That is a very valuable, worthwhile ministry. So that's on your quiz as well. Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. The Lord promises this in Matthew 11. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. I love that. And it's not come to me and I'll make everything better. Uh, but it is take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So that means we're walking with the Lord. And, and then, yeah, things are better. It's always better when you're walking with the Lord. You may still have the same problems you had before, but now at least you're walking with the Lord. I like that. All right. Finally, I'm in 20. Let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. And notice there's another verse here that leads up to this. The um, the, uh, the the fellowship of your faith may become effective. The fellowship of your faith, there it is in verse 6. The fellowship of your faith may become effective. And so this is, you're bearing fruit as you're fellowshipping. You're, you're, you, you, I have faith, you have faith, but when you are sharing your faith with me, when you are allowing your faith to become in common with my faith, notice what makes it effective, productive, what makes it working. It's the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. And we have the opportunity to identify with our position, possession, blessings in Christ and to, uh, to express those and to communicate those one to another. And so that, uh, that, uh, that knowledge is a powerful fellowship. So, yeah, I would add verse 6 to verse 20 there in Philemon. Looking forward to Philemon. When we wrap up uh, Colossians here, uh, we'll be in Philemon next at Austin Bible Church. So looking forward to that. God does comfort the depressed. And uh, when Titus showed up, this was a great comfort for Paul. He says, we've been comforted. In verse 13, and then um, back up to verse 6. God who comforts the depressed comforted us by the coming of Titus. And don't think that, well, I should be beyond this, or, well, you know, uh, Warren and Ethel, they're so, uh, they're so old in their, in their uh, mature, in their wisdom, and in their faith that, uh, you know, they never get depressed. They never get, they, they're always... They're always cycling doctrine. They've never, they haven't failed a test in, in 40 years, right? I mean, if you, if you get that thinking process going on, um, first of all, you're wrong. And then secondly, you're not edifying Warren and Ethel in any respect, and you're not doing them any favors. Um, we need to be praying for one another, even the, the most mature believer in our congregation. Because look at Paul. Paul said he was depressed. And it wasn't until the coming of Titus then that God was able to, uh, to comfort him and so uh, he is comforted and beyond that the joy of titus was just so infectious and he was able to celebrate that as well physical refreshment found through sleep and physical rest yeah he finds them sleeping he wants them to be praying for him are you still sleeping and resting so, yeah, don't confuse physical rest with spiritual rest. You need both. Definitely need both. And, of course, the faith rest life we had in the earlier Grace Note study. So many of these are passages we've already seen. We want to enter into rest. Rest from our work as God rested from his. All right. Then, of course, there is an eternal rest once we're away from uh, sin and away from the battle. They may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. That's why we have rest in peace. We have the, the expression RIP that we put on gravestones and other expressions related to that. They are resting, awaiting their resurrection. Okay. Well, that gets us down to the exercises then. Any final questions on refreshment or on anything really for this uh, for this week? Let me. Uh, you can turn. You can unmute yourself if you like. Let me reactivate your cameras.
You're now free to reactivate your cameras. Just remember, if you reactivate your cameras while I'm still recording, you'll be a part of that recording. All right. Well, a little rusty. I think we're, we'll do better next week. It's like riding a bicycle. I thought I was rusty in the pulpit this morning. Ethel has a question. Ideas on how to refresh another. Yeah, I think uh, being with them and fellowshipping with them, sharing scripture. Um, I think it's marvelous. Uh, you know, instead of instead of preaching at them or trying to uh, hit them with a verse that might solve their issues, I much rather I just I just rather just fellowship in unrelated scriptures. Let the Holy Spirit communicate it, and uh, fellowship with folks in different ways. Uh, visit with folks and say, hey, you know, where was your Bible reading this morning? I was reading about Absalom and um, just different things. And and just, uh, yeah, becomes greatly refreshing. Hmm. All right. And I never did confirm. Is that uh, Cornelius? Is that the caller that we received there? I did get your quiz. What is that MTD that Rob Atkinson mentions? MTD, I mentioned it in uh, church. It's called Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. Oh, yes. Okay. And uh, that's what people have substituted biblical Christianity with. And it's, it's a sad, okay. it's a sad imitation. All right. Well, good to see y'all. Glad you made it back. And Robert so Jewell. Let me open up 302 and see where we are next week. Pastor teachers, grace provision, salvation in the Old Testament. All right. Only three topics. Good deal. Pastor teachers, grace provision, and salvation in the Old Testament. All right, excellent. You'll enjoy those. Get your quizzes uh, completed. Be ready for next Sunday afternoon. It is Mother's Day next week. Is that going to be a problem? <laughs> okay. I guess uh, if it is, uh, we'll use gaps. <laughs> Ethel and Judy and I'm not sure other mothers that we might have. I don't know about Valencia. If Valencia is a mother. All right. All right. Well, let me close in prayer. Thank you all. Father, thank you for this class. Thank you for these students. Continue to bless our reading and our study. Help us to compare scripture to scripture. Help us to search the scriptures and see if these things are so. And uh, I do thank you, Father, and I praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Keep your armor on. Have a good one. <laughs>